This is probably one of the holy grail of all Nepenthes. This is phenomenal. It's so well organized as well. Like, it's Thank you. It's packed tight, but it's organized. Yes. Um, I like organization. and yeah, I could tell. <laughs> and they probably love to be kind of a little bit more shoulder to shoulder, so to speak, because it actually helps build up the humidity. And I mean, it's it definitely feels like a balmy 70 in here, at least. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's around 75 degrees and maybe about 80 90% humidity. Yeah, it's fantastic. So I guess, you know, word to the wise for anybody who's actually growing these in your home, very rare that you're going to get up to 80% humidity in your home. <laughs> you said that this one is uh, Loei? Yep, this is Nepenthes Loei. It's found on just a couple mountain ranges in Indonesia on the island of Borneo. And you could see the this white sugary substance. This is the exudate. And that is what the shrew eats and causes it to poop into the toilet or the pitcher. So what do you what do you feed this one then? So this just gets love and sometimes I fertilize with the foliar spray and orchid fertilizer um, with a lot of minor uh, nutrients and minerals. So I'll just spray that around and the pitcher will collect whatever it can from there. And there's a lot of insects and stuff that find their way in the greenhouse. I guess that makes sense for foliar spraying for, for these plants. Yes. Yeah. It just drips down inside the pitcher and there's so many pores in there that they absorb the nutrients fine. Yeah. I mean, not all plants are great for foliar feeding, but I think like telangias, you'd mentioned orchids, oh, yeah. you know, these, these actually definitely make sense. And so is it a specialized foliar spray with some specific micro and macronutrients just for Nepenthes or carnivorous plants? Or is it just like kind of an orchid one that? So there's a lot of different varieties that people use, especially they like getting into the seaweed fertilizer. I just try to stick to whatever is bare and minimal and anything with urea is usually not good because n the soil and the plant can't really break it down. Mm. So I try to stick to, you know, natural type stuff and um, just really minimal nutrients with orchid fertilizers. Great, great tips. And then this one right here is something that you had mentioned before <laughs> as well, and it's huge. This is my most favorite hybrid ever. Um, it gets one of the largest pitchers out of any of the plants. Mine still, I would consider a baby. Um, it's Loei Cross Truncata Giant, and it was created by my friends in Australia. And the color, the size, the interior um, is amazing. And it has these giant lid bristles that it gets from Loei. Um, Loei hybrids are actually probably some of my most favorite plants. They just produce this really deep red, wide interior. I just love the interior because it looks like it, it's seriously pixelated. I believe that it, they, some of them resemble rotting flesh in a way. Oh, that really makes sense, actually. Yeah. Or the and, and the coloration alone um, just attracts the certain type of insects that they feed upon. And now this one's actually quite large too. You said this one's quickly gaining on that one over there and yeah. he's kind of hiding off in the, in the midst over there. Yeah, he doesn't want to overshadow his uh, friend. Um, <laughs> this is Truncata cross Ophipiata and Ophipiata and Loei are both very similar species, but the Truncata is what really gives the plant size. I hoard Truncata hybrids because everything that you cross with it is just like a larger version of the male parent. And you know, a lot of these are, truly red leaf exotics. They're very <laughs> exotic, yeah. but there are some that are from kind of our native home state of like Pennsylvania and around here that yes. grow in bogs. And uh, you want to talk about these pitcher plants? Sure. This is Sarsenia purpurea. It's a native uh, pitcher plant or a North American pitcher plant. And these are awesome because they have these really fine hairs that all face down. So once a bug is on there, it can't really go up. It has no choice but to go <laughs> tid's death pretty much. And these don't produce digestive enzymes. They rely on skeetal larvae to break down anything that gets in there and then further um, absorb those fine nutrients once it's broken down. That's fascinating because, you know, I just had seen like a little mosquito larva just kind of, um, you know, swimming pretty nonchalantly like in, in, in this one right over here. Yeah. So unfortunately, people are usually disappointed that that's one of the only bugs they don't eat. <laughs> <laughs> they actually support them. Well, it's just, it just goes to show you again, you know, kind of removing mosquitoes from, 
you know, kind of the ecosystem could eventually cause some damage that we just wouldn't even think of, if exactly. you, especially if you didn't have your head in the penthes all day. Everything has purpose, everything. Now let's talk about this, these like really cool like peristomes, which is kind of this like little, the, the, I don't know if it's like at the neck or the rim call part. call them the lip. The lip, the <laughs> yeah, lip the part. Lip yeah. Point. Again, I just think it's like the show they put on for the insects. I mean, this is Nepenthes vichii. It's very wide and flared, and that's what it's noted for. But probably, if anything, um, a display for the plants and the ribbing in the peristome, which you can see close up, mm -hmm. again, helps things be directed toward their doom. And what would this be considered, this part right here? They call that the wing. Hmm. And most believe that it's almost like a ladder for the insects to climb up. Hmm. And then you said your other favorite is over here, <laughs> which I'd love to see. This is one of my favorite plants. I mean, the size and the coloration is just spectacular on it. And it's a female, so it's gonna give me a lot of babies. Fantastic. But this is Truncata uh, vicii maximus spectabilis. All those crossed together, and you get this beautiful, large, striped, colorful pitcher. Can you show me a little bit more of the dimorphism? Do you have ones that have like the really, you know, elegant um, ones coming out of the tendrils and some of like the, the ones below or? I can show you lower pictures. Mm -hmm. I don't believe I have anything that has both okay. at present, yeah. but you could, these are upper pictures. They face out, they're a mid, little more like a trumpet. They're smaller um, and you could see the tendril here wraps around and secures mm -hmm. the plant as to where a lower pitcher is just a big bulky pitcher. Right. They don't really gra wrap or uh, grow around anything. This is probably one of the holy grail of all Nepenthes. Um, it's Nepenthes Vichii and it's my, lo my company logo. That's what I w inspired it. And it gets these beautiful squat round pitchers with this striped peristome. And the thing that's really good about this one is usually with Vichii, um, the color isn't this intense or the pitchers aren't as round. And this one has every, like it's a dream Vichii pretty much. Um, I can actually show you one that's more typical looking, um, but this one's just really special. The color and the striping and that body, my favorite. Sundews are some of the more primitive and I believe David Attenborough's favorite. Um, they were Darwin's as well. Um, these have a ton of sticky dew drops on the leaves. And when an insect gets on there, the leaf will start to curl and actually like envelop the insect and just suck everything out of it. Oh my God, it's a, it's, I mean, this is the stuff that science fiction and some people's dreams are made out of, the, including your dreams. The little shop of horrors <laughs> is real. Look at these little guys right here. These are just adorable. This is a species, um, Nepenthes glabrata. It's known as the painted pitcher plant. And it does, it looks like you just put watercolor on it. And it's so bizarro because you look at these little tendrils that kind of attach to these plants and they're so delicate. So that you'd imagine, you know, you're putting all of this energy into this pitcher and you're hanging just on this little tiny bit of string. Yep. Um, this is a newer hybrid from my friends, Jeff and Andrea Mansell, um, and it actually came with these pitchers on it. But one of the parents in this is Mariliana, and she just gets these huge traps. So that's what's coming through in here, um, the giant traps of her. But I'd imagine if you have such a large trap that it's for something, maybe a larger creature, or am I just kind of like reaching, overreaching on that? No, Merlion in the wild is known to catch small mammals and a lot of the hybrids, especially these um, in cultivation, catch mice on the regular. My friend's nursery, when I went to visit, so many of their plants had mice in like all the pitchers, the larger traps, so they, they definitely uh, attract more than just insects. And how long do these leaves last for? Um, with good humidity and ideal conditions, the traps can last over a year. Wow. They can last very long. I could imagine just like all the energy that the plant is putting in to actually make these and, you know, in order to get that nitrogen source or all those micronutrients. I mean, because, you know, nitrogen is like one of those things that is so hard to get even in soil that has high nitrogen. So. Yeah. You know, um, the fact that they put in all this energy, I would, I would hope that they hold on to it for quite some time. They're dedicated. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs>
I hope you enjoyed that episode on Nepenthes. I mean, there were some really interesting varieties. So if you enjoy these episodes, be sure to subscribe to the channel at Homestead Brooklyn and follow along on my Instagram at Homestead Brooklyn and on the blog at homesteadbrooklyn.com. Later.